It's going to be an exciting spring for the entire family, right here on PBN. We've got several new dramas, comedies, and reality programming. Here's just an example of our new spring lineup. An Andorian couple return home from a much-needed vacation to find an infant left on their doorstep. They decide to raise their new baby son, but here's the wrinkle. The baby's human, but the madcap hijinks ensue. Hi, Stevie. How's my big boy? Did you get all your homework done? Yes, Mom. I even took out the trash. Very nice. You are certainly in a good mood today. I thought your first day would be a little harder on you. I must say, I'm pleasantly surprised. And how is my wonderful family today? Oh, just great, dear. DV was just telling me that he had a good day today. Gee, that's terrific, son. None of the other kids bothered you? You know, about being different, I mean? Some kids were whispering about me, but I ended up making a friend. I think he invited me to a party after school tomorrow. You think? What does that mean? Well, he asked me to meet him after school for a... Ushan? What? what? I hated losing my new friend, but I had to respect tradition. I'm sure his parents will understand. I just hope you learned your lesson today, Stevie. I sure did, Mom and Dad. I learned never to get caught in a duel to the death. But if I do, always lunge for the subterminous ventral artery just behind the left antennae. You will be an Andorian yet, sweetie. I love you, Mom and Dad. We, we love, love you, Pink Skin. Skin. Yes, it's Pardon My Pink Skin. Sundays, this spring. We interrupt this program for a Primetime News Network special report. Please give. Hi, I'm Captain P.F. Dennis. Some of you may know me from my wildly successful podcast, Primetime UGC. I'm here to draw your attention to a serious cause, one that is near and dear to my heart. It's about my co-host on the show. Well, he's not just a co-host, he's almost a friend, and his name is Casmodi. You've probably seen him around, he's over at Starbase UGC, and he does the news on our podcast. While I make boatloads as the producer, director, and star of the show, this man makes peanuts. Really, some weeks I pay him in trail mix. I don't need to tell you that in just a few months, there will be the biggest party of the year, Star Trek Las Vegas. That's right, and for those of us who have the means, it's just about the greatest place to be. For those who are less fortunate, well, they need a little help. That's why I'm here, donating my valuable time for which I normally expect substantial compensation to ask for your help. Please help out my friend. Let's get together in common cause to send Castmodian to Star Trek Las Vegas. He really doesn't need too much. I've already embezzled enough funds from the show to get him there, but without your help, he'll expect to sleep on my couch in my luxury suite, and I can't have that. What if I meet somebody? Anyway, for just a few bucks, you can make this otherwise miserable person feel something nearly close to happiness. 
And if you don't want to do it for him, do it for me. At least I'm modest, charming, and downright lovable. And most of all, I don't want to share my bathroom. I don't know where he's been. So please, help me to help cast Mo. It could mean the difference between pure joy or deep, gut-wrenching despair. Cast would appreciate it too, I think. Help me to send Cast Modi into Las Vegas, and I swear I won't bother you again. I'll personally thank each and every one of you who donates on Primetime UGC. Thank you for your support. Birds fly. Birds fly over the rainbow. Why and oh why can't I? Welcome to this edition of Kirk's Fat Assets. Since I'm running out of social zones, I decided to begin to look for assets in the early missions of the game. We'll start with the short cryptic mission called Stranded in Space. I actually had a hard time finding 10 assets since the mission really only contains one ground map. But let's do it. Number 10. Now, this is more of a feature request. It would be higher up the list if I thought it was even possible, but I'll ask for it anyways. Hey devs, do you think we could have this functionality with the dialog boxes where the background shows, the set shows? We could do so much with this functionality. Okay, now on to some more realistic choices. Number 9. The backdrop. Actually, this is probably already in the foundry if I'm not mistaken, but if it's not, it would make a good backdrop. Okay, on to some actual picks. Number 8. These walls and ceiling pieces. So many of our walls and sets in the foundry are flat, and Star Trek is recognized by its circular corridors. So please give us a few more set pieces like this wall so that we can make better corridors. Number 7. The turbo lift. We already have a turbo lift prop, but it's pretty small and difficult to use, especially with the spawn point inside of it. This turbo lift is nice and large. Please add it. Number 6. This floor, if an art dev textured a 100 by 100 flat platform with this texture, we would have a nice floor to use with matching walls. Texture a flat primitive, please. It would surprise me if it took more than a few minutes, and we really need these floors. Please? Number 5. This ceiling. If an art dev textured a 100 by 100 platform with this texture, we'd have a nice floor to use with matching walls. Texture a flat primitive, please. Please? Number 4. These walls. They'd be a nice alternative to the two Federation-style walls that we use to build our starships in our Star Trek game. Can we please have more than two Federation walls so we can build our Federation Star Trek ships in our Star Trek game? I know we have eight copies of the same wall, but just one copy of this wall would make a world of difference. Number 3. These lights, they are bold and interesting. We'd use them all over the place, from sick bays to transporter rooms. Please add more lights so our ceilings aren't black slabs of stone. Number 2. The Warp Core. Can we please have a Warp Core prop to build engineering sets in the Star Trek game? It may be the most obvious choice of a prop that belongs in the foundry besides the transporter pad that was recently added. And the number one fat asset is... The Carpet. If an art dev textured a 100 by 100 platform with this texture, we would have a nice floor to use with all kinds of walls. Texture a flat primitive, please. We're a little tired of building starships with stone floors, a boring gray slab for the ceiling, and other uninspiring pieces. Please devs, if you're embarrassed by the crudity of some foundry sets and what it does to the image of your game, please do something that allows us to make our sets less reminiscent of doom. And those are my top 10 fat assets from Stranded in Space. See you next time. This is a Star Trek Online public service announcement. 
You may or may not know that there is a Star Trek convention coming up in the fabulous city of Las Vegas, Nevada. This is happening on July 31st, 2014. You further may not know that our friends over at the GNT show really want to show off all that Foundry can do. That being said, they would really appreciate anyone who may have Foundry mission trailers to please forward them along. They will be showing them on a big screen for all the convention goers to see. Pretty, pretty, pretty cool if you ask me. Anywho, these missions gotta be one minute or more in length. I would say no more than three minutes would be good. Go check out their website for more details. The address is www.gandtshow.com. That's www.gandtshow.com. You like Foundry? Good. Then get your ass over there and get them your trailer. Welcome to Primetime's Author Interviews. As normal, I'm Casmodian, and joining me tonight is our emergency holographic co-host, Cerberus Films. Tonight is another of our interviews with 12 Fleet's Foundry authors, and joining us is Knuckles. Let's all raise a mug of blood wine to his honor and get right into it. Good evening, Knuckles. Hello. Good evening. So I suppose we will let our emergency ho- co-host start right in with... So, when and how did you first get involved in the Foundry? Oh, wow, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> I guess when you hit the end game, I just thought, well, especially playing Klingons, that there wasn't too much to do uh, as mm. opposed to the Federation. So I kind of thought the Foundry might be a good source of generating fun things for the KDF to do. And yeah, just kind of jumped right into it and really had a, a mess of a time trying to learn how to use it because there's really no tutorials at the time. Was this start, say, when the Foundry first launched or more recently um, than that? Gee, I don't even remember when the Foundry first came out. I guess this was about two years ago. So the Foundry was still pretty barren. It didn't have a lot of the, the newer stuff that they've added in the past couple of years. It's been nice to have the, the waypoint updates and some of the map changes. And the rally point changes have been huge. And getting the animations back for the, the ships, it's like having them being able to decloak or warp in and warp out and that kind of thing. Now, if only we can get them to hold weapons properly. Yeah, or if we could get people to be able to beam off planets, that would be great. Because that's my biggest uh, my biggest problem right now is I have a lot of missions where I'd love to have characters be able to beam off a planet, and you just kind of have to make them vanish or a rock absorb them to hide them. Well, unfortunately, that pretty much means having to uh, change the animations to play off of state changes as opposed to the way the animations work right now, which I don't think we're going to see anytime soon. It's always that small yeah. glimmer of hope. Oh, sure. We, we say things on, on podcasts and they show up in Neverwinter, so... Oh, maybe one day they'll make it to SDO. They're the same team, I think, working on the Foundry. Yes, one day. Uh, not today. Not tomorrow. No. And maybe. probably not even when this uh, broadcast goes out. What inspirations do you draw all your ideas from for your missions? Are there any sources beyond Star Trek that you use? Um, I'm a huge sci-fi fan. I mean, I watched almost every sci-fi under the sun, Stargates, Battlestar Galactica, gosh, you name it, I've probably seen it. So I kind of draw off of everything that I've, I've seen. There are some episodes of specific sci-fi series that I think if you could translate that into a Foundry mission, that would be amazing, which I've kind of got one or two on the go like that right now based off of one's, um, I don't know if anyone's a Galactica fan here, but uh, the episode where uh, Galactica jumps down into the atmosphere of a planet and launches all their vipers to free their friends who have been captured by the Cylons. I kind of have something going on. Okay, so so Ronald like Moore, Galactica, that was the one thing I was wondering. Yeah, oh, sorry, yeah, the, <laughs> the new one, the 2005. Oh, five, yeah. Yeah, it's oh, been that long. Really? Right, oh, God. Yes. I can't believe it, almost yeah. 10 years. The miniseries was 10 years ago. But yeah, right. so then there's, there's just like Star Trek, which is you know, source material for any and all things. And the great thing about being on the Klingon side of the foundry is that you really have free reign, right? Like there's no... Mm-hmm. There's no real set you have to follow. You can kind of be a bit liberal with how you interpret certain episodes of the Klingon content you saw in the series itself. And I was going to say, I assume that with Star Trek, you draw a lot of your inspiration from the DS9 side of things, considering that it had a far larger number of Klingon episodes. Yeah, I mean, when I was doing one of my Foundry missions, my second one, I think it was called Warriors of the House, I actually rewatched 
which episode was it? It was a TNG episode, the Romulans with Sila when she comes back and she's doing the blockade thing. I was going to say during the uh, Duras Civil War. Right, the Civil War. So I watched those episodes to kind of get a feel for how the houses worked and the subterfuge and all that kind of things. Because I do deal with that in some of my founding missions, the Romulans and the Duras again. Mm-hmm. So I rewatched those TNG episodes. But yeah, the, the DS9 ones where you get into the, the Gauron versus Martok and a lot more talk of the houses and what they mean really played a big part in it. And that sort of leads me into another one of my questions. What is your feeling of the current political climate in the Klingon Empire right now, based off of the Honor Guard missions? It's an interesting question. It's really hard to put your finger on it. You know, something's wrong. You don't really know what it is exactly. And Cryptic hasn't, you know, haven't really offered too many answers as far as the Klingon story goes. But it looks like it's all maybe coming full circle. The episodes that they've been releasing with the Dyson stuff and sounds like the Undine are coming back. So maybe we'll get more answers for everyone there. But you kind of get the feeling that some of the houses aren't on the same page as, as Jempok or the House of Martok, which is, well, in shambles, it's still around. So you want to get some answers there, I think. You don't seem to have a very high opinion of the uh, leadership of Jempok. I don't. No, I'm... I think it's the way he was introduced. He killed off my favorite character. So if you take out Martok, I'm not going to like you that much. But yeah, I mean, he's he's aggressive, well, at least the way they introduced him. He was aggressive in a time where I didn't think he had to be very aggressive. So it kind of felt as though his actions were very forced just to deliver a, a plot point in Stowe's story. And I wasn't a huge fan of that. But as I've done my research for my Foundry missions and I've gone through the wikis and I've, I've read all of the story stuff in the game again, I've gone through it. I kind of have a slightly higher opinion of him now. I don't think he is necessarily the most evil person, but there is someone around him or there's a group of people around him that are clearly, you know, helping to pull the strings. So I kind of wanted to explore that in the Foundry missions and see where that would end up. And of course, that's the wonderful thing about the Foundry is that we can do that and uh, we can make everything, we can make anything we want to happen. And it's our headcanon. <laughs> and you never know, it might end up one day being in the game. At least yeah, until we... uh invalidate our own headcanon. <laughs> yes. Well, I've never been a huge fan of just the war in general, the Federation Klingon war. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, there's a couple. I love Stowe, 100%. It's one of my, my favorite games. I love Star Trek. I'm a huge, unstoppable Star Trek fan. You'll, I might not be able to name every episode, but I love... I'll, if it's on TV, I'll watch it, and I'll turn it on just to watch it. But I've never been behind the whole way that the Stowe story kind of collapsed the Federation Klingon experience into a war and everyone's killing everyone instead of disabling their ships. So <laughs> that was my biggest gripe coming into this game was that the Federation is just killing everyone. And there's no mercy given. Yeah, and that's why playing a Klingon actually, you know, it's not too bad because, you know, a Klingon may just destroy everyone. They may not have to, to disable people and drag them around in tractor beams to star bases. Mm-hmm. They can blow things up and feel good about it. Or just send them off to Repente. Yeah, exactly. See, but now I have this wonderful image of just starships everywhere, just towing other players around. <laughs> ga- gathering a fleet of starships in, in various tractor beams behind you and just, you know, rolling around the galaxy. That'd be fun. That'd be a lot of fun. Or just launch other starships at people using tractor beams. <laughs> uh, I, w- I wouldn't want to be the programmer trying to implement that, but uh, yeah, that'd be fun. Yours is not to reason why, but to code or die. So where do you see the Klingon Empire sort of heading? in storyline. We've, we've talked a bit about your dislike for, for Jim Park and, and the Federation cling on war, but where do you see that, that sort of going in the future? And do you plan on then sort of working on that with your Foundry missions? I do, and if I hadn't have gotten so busy in the fall, I probably would have released, I think, my fourth episode, which is sort of heading in that direction. Um, so 12th Fleet is primarily Federation fleet. You know, several Federation divisions and the one Klingon Honor Guard, or 12th mm-hmm. Honor Guard, rather. And so what we were going to do is sort of tie the 12th together, so have the Federation and the Klingons sort of meet, and in some way or another they would become allies or or friends in a time of war. So you would have the 12th fleet and the 12th honor card, sort of, Mm -hmm. despite conflict, they would be friendly with one another. And I was going to explore that in, I think, episode 4 or 5, but I kind of see, you know, I don't want to too huge spoilers, but I'm pretty sure most people have played that new Dyson mission by now, that it seems like peace may be on the horizon. I don't know what form that will take, if it'll be a, you can play with anyone, like actual gameplay, because that would be nice if I could do a Klingon Starbase defense without waiting half an hour, or, you know, if it's just going to be a story story thing and the gameplay itself won't actually change. But it's something that I think we've reached that point in Stowe now, where, you know, we've had the war for 
however many years this game's been going, and it's time to maybe put that aside. Because we've had so many huge threats, right? Like we've had the Borg, the Dominion have come back, the Undine, have, they've been here and there, and now we've got the Voth, the Dyson Spheres. How can you maintain a war with all these bigger threats that everyone should really be coming together to fight? So that was kind of the, the draw with the Foundry missions, was to have that. And they all take place basically, I guess, somewhere near the start of Stowe's storyline. So the big Borg stuff hasn't happened yet, and the Undine stuff hasn't happened yet, and the boss stuff, it's not there yet in my Foundry missions anyways. And that was something that maybe I would get to if, if I had the time. But hopefully peace is coming, and I can queue with some Federation people for, for some missions. See, that just doesn't sound very Klingon, though. You want peace? You really want peace? I want uh, the enemy of my enemy is my friend, so oh. <laughs> I want to uh, I want to fight the Borg and not have to worry about the Federation shooting me in the back at the same time, because <laughs> that seems like what they might do now. They don't seem very honorable anymore. With all that said, what is the last mission that you played that you thought was just absolutely excellent? It can, of course, be one of your own, and it could also be even uh, Federation side. Well, all of the twelfth authors. I've had a chance to play their missions. I can't remember the names of them off the top of my head. I will look them up and shout them at you. But they're amazing missions. One of them is a Federation spotlight, and one of them is actually currently at the Klingon spotlight, done by Khan, and it's uh, it's a great mission. They're Terrors all, of the Past, I believe. That's the one, yeah. They're all fantastic missions, so if anyone has a chance to play those, I would highly recommend them. And then, I'll, yeah, I'll shameless plug. I have My third mission is probably my favorite one. It took me the longest, and I, it's extremely long. It's, it's probably too long. I probably should not have added the last map that I did. <laughs> but I might go back and, and fix it, because it's uh, probably a little excess. There's a sequence um, on, uh, on a Romulan planet of just explosions, just nonstop explosions, which took forever to get all the triggers working properly and, and all that, and that's probably my favorite little... It's not a whole... The, not, the whole mission isn't my favorite, but just that little... Little sequence is probably one of my favorites. But yeah, go play all the Twelfth Authors missions because they're they're really fun. They're really good story driven stuff. Oh, and we have definitely been working through them ourselves in order to bring them to others. Yeah, that's one of the things. I mean, I love again the Foundry and, and Stowe, but I wish that there was. They've been trying with their tagging system to, yeah, uh, I guess promote how you find missions and all that kind of stuff. But it'd be really nice if they would have an easier way of accessing the Foundry because you've got so much great content and there's so many amazing authors and it's really hard to sift through it all to find a good mission or, you know, something that you're you're looking for specifically. Maybe you want a, a really good story mission or you just want to do the, one of those farming missions. It's becoming easier, but it's still kind of hard to navigate. And if you don't know where you're looking, it's hard to find sometimes. No, oh, and uh, we we here at Primetime completely agree with that assessment. Oh, yes, very much so. Now it's time to end our show with our wrap-up questionnaire we call the Primetime Five. We'll ask you five questions to answer, each with a choice. No elaboration is necessary. Your uh -oh, answers okay. will tell our viewers a little bit more about you. Uh, so first up, Ractagino or Root Beer? Root Beer. Constitution or Galaxy Class? Vorcha. Miniskirt or scant? Scant. Cisco or Janeway? Ben Cisco. And finally, phaser or disruptor? Disruptors. Well, yeah. that is very interesting. And I believe with that, we will wrap up tonight's interview. Thanks to our guest, Knuckles, for coming by and sharing his thoughts. Thanks for having me. Thank you very much. And good night, folks. have I got a treat for you this week. Hot off the press and loaded with phantom-like villains, secret facilities, unknown planets, and strange spatial phenomena, The Phoenix of Bavar 1 and 2 will keep you guessing to the very end. From the shadow of Bajor emerges a threat like none other you have ever faced. Wait a second. Hey, cat! Yeah, you in the sound booth. Go cover your ears. What? Yeah, I mean now. Yes, folks. Today I'm going to be looking at a brand spanking new mission series by our very own Captain P.F. Dennis. Before I get any further into this review, it's important to note that Cap wrote these two episodes under a different account. If you do a search, you'll see them listed just under P.F. Dennis, without the Cap part of his name. Let me start by saying what a huge DS9 fan I am. I mean, when I finished watching Deep Space Nine for the first time, 
I literally cried. To me, Nerese and Odo were real people. The whole of the Star Trek cast felt like a family, one that I had suddenly and violently been torn from. As I played the Phoenix of Bavar 1 and 2, I felt a familiar sensation sweep over me. The opening notes of the Star Trek theme song filled my mind, and from the tips of my toes came that long-lost shiver of excitement. This mission brings a whole new level of meaning to the word interaction. Trust me, this is not one of those storylines where you just sit there and hit the F key until your eyes glaze over and rot out of your head. Whether you're negotiating with the wily Vorta, tiptoeing over a flaming abyss, or sharing the honor of battle with a Klingon warrior, this mission series will keep you wholly engaged in every second of adventure. With his cleverly created cast of characters, the captain sheds light on names and faces from DS9 shadows. Forgotten plot threads from the TV show are skillfully woven into an absolute masterpiece. From Birno the Pandering Vorta, to Captain Jorah, a loving father with a deep sense of duty. The beliefs, values, and viewpoints of each canon race are portrayed with precision accuracy and great respect. The character's depth is not limited by lore, but rather the author uses his craft to give them a sense of genuine relatability. Cap's meticulousness is not merely limited to his characters, however. His precision spills over into every facet of this mystically infused epic. And don't think that this story is without action. There are massive battles to be found here. The odds of ancient Thermopylae are repeated here among the stars as you dash through heart-stopping chases and venture beyond blood-stained altars. Now, for a word or two about the backdrop of this tale. From a lush planet to the bowels of Hades, every nuance is painted with bold and bright strokes. Effects are used with liberality, yet not recklessly creating an otherworldly field reminiscent of the climax of DS9 in What You Leave Behind. Without giving too much away, Cap has done some of the most painstaking trigger work that I have ever seen in a mission, bar none. In the heart of this mission is a labyrinth which will require your footsteps to be circumspect and your attitude to be one of utter patience. You can't rush headlong into this challenge, but you must pause to stop and consider each move carefully. The costumes that were used throughout were appropriate and well done. I did notice one slight inconsistency in the appearance of the character, and to his credit, the author literally had it fixed within hours. Thoughtfully posing some of the same questions as the Voyager episode Sacred Ground, P.F. Dennis explores the seeming paradox created by the intersection of faith and science. My only suggestion on the topic of immersion was when I commented to him that I would like to see more response options that were oriented towards a player with a strong faith such as myself. Most of the dialogue choices he gave took the traditional view of scientifically sterile skepticism displayed by nearly every Trek captain from Kirk to Janeway. The cap took my suggestion to heart and recently informed me that he plans to incorporate some faith-based dialogue as soon as time allows him to do so. Even with limited paths to choose from, this story was so utterly compelling that I never would have considered not finishing it. Primary gender rigidity was never an issue during this mission, even though the traditional masculine military terms are used throughout. As far as the rating on sexual content is concerned, I think it's safe to say that if this were a movie, the MPAA would give it a wholesome PG rating without any reserves. So in closing, this is Wordcraft at its finest. If you are looking for a mission series that contains rollicking adventure, heart, brains, and deep trek roots, then look no further. Matter of a fact, why am I standing here talking? I'll shut up now and you can get out of here and go play it. Welcome to episode 31's published in primetime. It's been a busy weekend here at Star Trek Online for the Foundry, but not for making missions, for playing them. It was the Big Marks weekend this past weekend, so we've only got four Federation missions on the list tonight that are brand new. And here they are. First up, it's Shadows Rising by Sith Scourge, level 31+. Starfleet reports that several ships have been attacked with their crews abducted. 
Ship's logs indicate the Ferasans may have been involved. Contact was lost with the last ship that was pursuing the attackers. A two-part mission, Requiem for a Dream, by 11001001 version 2.0. This mission is level 41 plus. An old friend requests you participate in a targ hunt in his stead. You soon make an important discovery. The next is a three-part mission called Uncharted Worlds by Pat Crow. The first mission is any level, the second, 31 plus, and the third mission is any level. Pat Crow says, my Uncharted World series features non-combat exploration missions. Are you tired of shooting things? Want to do science in your science ship? Then these are the missions for you. And last, but certainly not least, is Summit at Athena by Solari. This mission is any level. You have volunteered to escort Ambassador Jennifer Kyle to the Athena refueling station at Athena in the Donatu sector. What starts as a simple escort mission ends up turning into a trip which not only puts the Ambassador in danger, but threatens the life of your entire crew. And that about wraps up episode 31 of Primetime UGC. Thank you for joining us. And please, donate to Casmodian's trip to Las Vegas. You really could use your help. You can contact us at mailbag at primetimeugc.com. See you next time.